Welcome to the Tudor Dixon podcast. For all of you listeners out there, you know that I am pretty passionate about pharmaceuticals and the pharmaceuticals that we're giving our kids and the massive amount of antidepressants that are out there today. I just feel like there's been a lot of overprescribing happening out there. I have a few friends that are pharmacists and they would be the first to tell me that those are the number one prescriptions they have every day. But in addition to this, these, these medications, they have side effects that we're not really prepared for. The people are, I believe, unwilling to talk about. And I started to kind of peel back the layers of the onion on some of these things that are happening with kids today. We've seen these high suicide rates and and it struck me as I was sitting there thinking about school shootings and suicide rates and that I was like, you know, when I was younger and these ads were on for these medications, they always ended with, if you're considering suicide or harming someone else, contact your doctor right away. And it made me go, man, the first school shooting I knew about was Columbine. And I kind of went through that information, started digging, and I found a gentleman who I thought, man, this guy sounds interesting. I want to talk to him. And he graciously agreed to join the program. So we are fortunate to have Dr. Peter Bregan with us. He is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. And this was Harvard a few years back. So it's like pre-woke Harvard. So you don't have to be worried about that. He has decades of experience at the highest level in the field of psychiatry. He is known as the conscience of, of psychiatry for his criticism and efforts to reform the mental health field in a good way. Dr. Bregan, thank you for joining me. Oh, Tudor, this is a wonderful comment you made about being pre-woke Harvard. Don't worry. <laughs> Actually, Harvard was woke before everybody else because they're the leaders and when I applied to Harvard, I already knew the people because I'd run a big volunteer program as a Harvard undergrad in the state mental hospital. And I thought I was going to a psychologically and somewhat socially oriented program. And the year I got there, and <clears throat> I knew the people, they said, Peter, it's not like you think anymore. It's now computer diagnosis and drugs. And that was 1962, 63. So Harvard was ahead of everybody. And honestly, you're, you're more likely to get a decent deal on, on drugs from uh, somebody who hasn't gone to Harvard uh, and hasn't gone to Yale and Columbia and the St. Louis and all the big schools. You're more... Because you know, it's are. interesting that you say that because we had a guy on here, his <clears throat> name is Callie Means, and he said his sister had gone to medical school, gone into psychiatry, and she kept saying, or maybe, no, I think it was psychiatry, or perhaps it was like just general medicine, and she kept saying, there are ways to treat this without pharmaceuticals, and they were like, yeah, that's that's not our thing. We're not into like the holistic part of medicine. And he said she was, she realized that the whole medical system was to push medicine and make sure that you're on something. And then, yeah, just last week I was actually at a meeting and I was talking to this gentleman who works in some way with discounts on medicine. And it, it was so shocking to me because he said, yeah, I, I figured out that, you know, I sat with the pharmaceutical companies and they explained, you know, we don't mind if people get discounts. Our goal at one point is to make sure everyone in the family is on, on a pharmaceutical. So if we get them with the discount, then eventually they'll pay full price. And it was so mind blowing to me. The pharmaceutical companies want everyone, whether you need it or not, to be on a pharmaceutical? It's, it's marketing. It's a gross form of capitalism. I call it predatory capitalism. <clears throat> it's very similar to predatory communism and predatory Marxism. It's all about those with the power taking advantage of those without the power. And this is what's happened in our country. COVID-19 became the excuse for medicine being completely taken over by the CDC and the FDA and then that goes up to the World Health Organization. And then the World Health Organization, which is run by a communist named uh, Tedros, <clears throat> they, they, it sort of is controlled on the one hand by uh, uh, Xi Jinping, who put him into office, the, the leader of communism, but on the other hand by Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab and the, the mm. Western Empire people. Um, and it's all about ultimately control. We're very much in a period of time 
I'm 87 years old. I have never seen anything like this, nor spoken like this before three years ago. There is an evil force now that has given us things like um, Joe Biden. I mean, he's not even hardly a person. He's like a, 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 a creation of this power that's leaning on us. Mm -hmm. And we really need to be aware of it. Ultimately, our children are suffering from this pharmaceutical oppression, but it's a bigger oppression. It's the same oppression that's that's uh, that's got us uh, mutilating little girls when they're 12 because they think they want to be boys. It's <clears throat> part of the whole system we're looking at, which is taking, well, uh, the, taking us down. I want to get into that because we we talk about the pandemic and, and the depression that we saw in the pandemic. And that was almost, I guess I would say for the pharmaceutical companies, almost twofold. They got to come at us with the jab and say, everybody has Absolutely. to have this. But at the second, the second half of that is all of a sudden you have all these teenagers that are suffering from depression. Naturally, they were kept out of school. There's that's a critical time in life. And they just seized on that as here's that next prescription. And so suddenly we saw girls that were 12 to 18 getting massive doses of antidepressants. It just started becoming yes. the norm that these girls were getting antidepressants. But at the same time, it's strange to me because at that same time, we saw a massive increase in suicides just among girls, again, ages 12 to 18. And I, in my own family, have seen this where it's, oh, we've got to put you on an antidepressant. And it, I can't explain it other than you lose the person. That's exactly right. That's a very good way of looking. You lose the person. It suppresses everything in the brain, the antidepressants. Uh, you can't get closer to God. You can't even love your dog as much. You can't relate to your family. It's it's so consistent, all of this. It's anti-family. It's anti-God because it's suppressing our higher spiritual capacities for love, for relationship. And I do believe that girls are more sensitive to this, especially when they're children. They're much more social than men. They're much more alert to fine-tuning emotions. So I think they're much more hurt by uh, things like a lockdown or or having to do your school on a TV. But the other side of it that is kind of newer to my awareness, and I'm trying to make people aware of, is that the vaccines, the all, all of the, the two vaccines that we mostly get, Moderna and Pfizer, these vaccines are not vaccines. They're tinkering with our genetic makeup, and they do cause a brain fog, just like COVID causes a brain fog because the vaccine is making the same, makes your body make the spike proteins that are in COVID. So our body is making COVID for us with the vaccines and that causes brain fog. And I think a lot of people who think they're depressed have a bad brain mm. fog. So the, the extent that this is a comprehensive assault on us today is very, very important. And, and you're, you're political, so let me take it to that political level. This is a war against constitutional democracy. That's what's really going on around the world. And yeah, but this war that you talk about, I just want to, because I want to be clear that on both sides of the aisle, there are politicians who take big money from drug companies oh, to yes. get into office, and then they are fully devoted to that drug company. That's right. Well, that's right. Uh, well, and, you know, with talking politics, the Koch family, who are supposed to be Republicans and supposed to be freedom people, for example, they are globalists. And that's where they ran into tr trouble with Donald Trump, who very early wanted to stand up to China, America first. If you're America first, you're against this larger system. And uh, the Koch brothers buy Republican politicians. Everybody thought it was wonderful, except they want open borders, which is the destruction of America. They want it because it makes one helpless workforce that's global so they can take advantage of rather than having to deal with American workers with their higher expectations. So mm -hmm. this is a part of 
this is really a lot of stuff we're talking about here, but uh, I hope it's not too much at once. No, but. no, it, it's, it's perfect. I mean, this is kind of, I think we're all sort of trying to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. And, yes. and from both a political and a medical perspective, from the political perspective, I have seen all of these folks that have gotten kind of drawn into that malicious capitalism that you're talking about, because it, it's crony capitalism, you know, I'll get you that's into what, office, right. you that's do right. this. And then and then we end up all having a vaccine or we end up all being pushed with the medical community. And, yes. and I had this experience myself where my daughter was really struggling. And my gosh, she must have been eight years old. And we went to a psych a psychologist and we were there for gosh it must have taken three weeks before she wrote a letter to our medical doctor saying this child has to be on an anti anti-anxiety medication and i said no way you're not putting my kid on meds i'm done i'm out forget it we're gonna fix this God a different way you for that. but they stalked me they had the, the they it was like no now we have this on record i mean i was afraid that they were gonna send the government after me, like we yeah. have this on record, you have to go to the psychiatrist now. And I said, if you do not stop calling me, I will block you and I will call and, and file harassment. She's not coming. We're done with you. But how many, but I think about the aggression that they had with me. How many mm -hmm. parents would just say this? Because I think innately we want to trust the medical community, right? Yeah. Innately we're like, there must, if they yeah. say there needs to be a drug, there must be a problem. I have to take it. Yeah. I'll bet that that therapist is getting patients from the psychiatrist and then she sends patients back to him fresh, new, and they have a nice little circle going there. Right. So and that's how it, exactly how it works. So what in Michigan, it's like, well, I know from people that I know c closely that you have to have two appointments a month with your psychologist. So it goes two psychology appointments, one psychiatrist. So anybody who's on meds is also paying for three appointments a month. So that's yeah. like an ongoing income, three appointments a month, and then whatever the meds are too. And generally you're on two or three meds. It's not like you're on one med. They, they keep getting you. Well, and then you're on a med and it causes you to do something where, well, we'll fix that with this med. Yeah. And then you have high blood pressure. We'll fix that with this med. And suddenly you're on six medications. Absolutely. And it's inevitable because the antidepressants cause suicidality and depression. They cause the opposite in a way. It's still abnormal. They cause mania and bipolar disorder. When I was in my training, if we saw a bipolar patient in the mental hospital, it was so unusual to see a manic attack that we would hold grand rounds and present the patient with their permission and discuss what they were going through. It's gone from a rare problem to a mm. common one. And the reason is twofold. A, most of the, of the worst drugs can cause mania. Even, this, even the tranquilizers, particularly Xanax, can cause mania. The stimulants we give our kids cause mania, and the antidepressants cause mania. So they're all causing, quote, bipolar disorder. And furthermore, they love to diagnose bipolar disorder. The drug company is really big for it because you can give any drug you want for bipolar disorder in their minds, not in reality, but in their minds. So let's talk about some specific cases because you were involved in the Michelle Carter case. And for people who don't oh understand that case, this was the 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 woman who I guess texted her boyfriend to death, a 17 year old, I say a woman, but these are children. And that's the thing that I think is so upsetting about this. You have children who are still growing. Their brains are not developed. You have these chemicals right. going into their brain. And I have people who constantly tell me, well, you don't know what it's like that I need, you know, this person needs these chemicals to fix something that's wrong and make them better. But then I see this 17 year old woman, young woman, girl who gets into this text message situation, and a boy ends up dead. What happened there? Well, it's not at all the picture that the news would give you, which is all part of the system, of course. But what happened is very, very clear. At a quite young age, at 14 or 15, her boyfriend gets on Prozac. I was able to document mm -hmm. from his texts. He had so many, I had thousands of pages of communications that he quickly became psychotic 
He's mm. very quickly talking about the devil. He's very quickly weirded mm. out. She ends up on Prozac too, and she starts to get changed. That both their personalities change. Yep. He is a bully. He is constantly bullying her and and trying to control her typical, you know, cheesy male, young male stuff. And then when he gets depressed, um, he toward the end of his life starts to beg her to help him die. And she doesn't know what to do. She's been trying to keep him from dying and keep him from dying. And finally she says, okay, I will try. And she write maybe one or two texts. She's listening to him, begging her. And she says, well, why don't you do it? Or something like that. She's the victim, not him. And mm. he's a victim of the system, of the psychiatry system. He also uh, had been hit and beaten by his dad. I mean, this was not what it looked like to be at all. But but the drugs played a huge role in it. That was my testimony. And um, although they didn't want to come out and agree with me in public, what eventually happened was that uh, she got a very minor term. She got convicted of something, and then she got a, she never went to jail. She went to a kind of halfway place, and she got out pretty quickly. I never bring her up, by the way, and I want the folks to know this. I never bring up Michelle because I honor her privacy. Mm. But since you brought up, which is fine, you're a reporter, I, she's a wonderful young, young woman. She was always a, she was one of the most popular kids in her class. She got awards for popularity before she got on the drugs. See, and that, that to me, what you just said is so shocking because we think of kids who end up changing because of drugs as illegal drugs, but these are drugs, these are pharmaceuticals. And I, and I think that probably everybody listening can think of either a student in their class or someone in their own family who they've seen this change, this transi transition happen. And I know you said, well, this isn't consistent in all school shootings and all mass shootings. But I think a lot of us have said, well, why don't we get a toxicology report afterward? Because if there is some connection in many of these, if there is, if you can look at many of these shootings and say, wow, pharmaceuticals played a role in their life in some way, yes. in even 90% of these situations, shouldn't we be looking at that? My gosh, we talk about gun control and this and that and, and the mental health crisis, but is the mental health crisis in, in part caused by the drugs that they're on for their mental mm -hmm. health? And if that's the case, who has control over this? Because all of these drug companies have immunity and nobody's willing to take them on. Well, it's very much what introduced me and prepared me for COVID-19 and, and to understand it better than most, because I watched this in my own career where I saw the newspapers go from reporting on Prozac deaths, related mm -hmm. deaths, suicides and murders, to they didn't at all, to the coroners reporting on it till they didn't at all. And in fact, one of the few cases where we got information was Eric Harris and the Columbine shootings because he was over 18. And in that case, the coroner did release the information to the public. And it was very ironic what he said. He said Eric Harris had a therapeutic level of Luvox in his blood at the time of his death. And now therapeutic indeed. That meant he had enough to, to, to affect him. And it... Uh, it had, he, uh, I went through Eric's records, and you can see him getting crazier and crazier after he's put on the drugs. He was not crazy before he was put on the antidepressants. So was that kind of a, a perfect storm of teenage angst with Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris having the medication and those two being kind of the perfect storm of yeah. taking a kid who was feeling hopeless, wasn't getting dates, having the typical struggles of a high school student in Dylan and Eric saying kind of being the supercharged machine, which which honestly is what we see. Oftentimes, a lot of these drugs and these stimulants are well, given to our soldiers. So what's the difference? Yeah, it's a it's a mania. Now, we don't know uh, what Dylan Klebold was on or not on. I've never seen evidence one way or another, um, but we I, I, we clearly know for Eric Harris. But 
one of the things that's important that people don't realize is the control over the news was there around the antidepressants before we got the control of the news around COVID. And I was like a part of watching all mm. that evolve. I was a part of being on Oprah, being on Larry King Live, being on every single major TV, and then the pharmaceutical in regularly. And then the pharmaceutical industry got the right to direct consumer advertising for the first time, one of the only countries in the world that does that, and then I couldn't be on the TV anymore. So the controls, you could just actually see them uh, as, as they occur. And so you couldn't be on TV because their advertisers were pharmaceutical companies, so they would say, we can't have someone come on and say something negative about the pharmaceutical companies because they're paying us. I mean, think of that's malicious capitalism, what you're talking about. Yeah. That is shocking. But but that's also unique to the United States because in other countries, you can't advertise drugs like this. That's right. That's right. Um, the, the, the situation is so bizarre that USA today did a follow-up 10th anniversary or something, I can't remember what it was, of the Eric Harris uh, situation. And they said, we now know Eric Harris was not on psychiatric drugs. <gasps> and I sent him a letter and I showed him the, uh, you know, the, get the coroner's report and the whole works. They never answered me. So uh, this, this awful thing we see so clearly now was creeping up in my arena of the psychiatric drugs because the pharmaceutical industry is the cutting edge of totalitarianism. It's really what's going on. It doesn't mean they do it, you know, maybe there's somebody even behind Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab, but those people who have the power to control the banking industry, which is very much involved in all of this, and to control the military industrial complex and so on, um, these these folks have been managing us for a long, long time. I just happened to have stood up on lobotomy. I stopped most of the lobotomies in the Western world back in 72, 3, 4, 5, and I couldn't believe what was being done to me to try to stop mm. me. It was just unbelievable. So this has been the way of things for a long time. Psychiatry, my profession, which when I went into it, I thought had a psychosocial wing, but it disappeared. When, when I, by the well, time and I, I think that there. most of us can look at lobotomy now and go, gosh, how could you do that? But at the same time, I, I think of my own experience where they're like, no, no, she has to be on this medication. Right. And if, if I weren't aware of what these medications do to people, I think parents can very easily be con convinced like this is, this is, I mean, a medication is a medication. If you have to be on it, you have to be on it. It's going to save your life. It's going to change your life. And yeah. I think that it is almost a medical lobotomy for a lot of kids because yes, they're no is. longer wanting to play. They, they're just not the same. They're not the same. It is a medical lobotomy. And something that's important to get in is that none of these children have anything wrong with their brains, unless they have mm. to have had a series of concussions or have a disease, which is really rare in the people you see in a practice. There's nothing wrong with the brains of people who get depressed. We've not even found anything in the brains of people who get high and manic or, or psychotic or act, act like my colleagues call schizophrenic. These are manifestations of the human condition under various stresses. They are not diseases. There is no known disease in the psychiatric lexicon of depression and anxiety and uh, PTSD and so on. They throw in Alzheimer's, which is a disease, to make themselves look like real doctors, but Alzheimer's not a psychiatric disease, even though psychiatrists want to mix us all up about it. The things we treat in psychiatry are usually patently obvious to a thoughtful conversationalist. That's all you got to be, a thoughtful conversationalist with a person who wants to talk to you about their troubles, and the, the troubles almost always within an hour unravel as going through so much, like who wouldn't be depressed? This article you sent me, they talked about uh, children going through more hopelessness and helplessness. 44% of children when, had some hopelessness and helplessness under COVID. That's only because they're lying. They all did. They didn't want to tell everything. Everybody right. felt helpless and hopeless going mm -hmm. through COVID. I certainly did. 
especially when I started to, to do the research and write about it, I felt overcome with evil. And my wife and I, we spent hours keeping our spirits up and talking about giving it up to God and stuff like that so we could deal with this stuff we research on a daily basis. And you know, I've told people beings. many times that I remember putting my oldest to bed and at the time she was 10 years old during the pandemic and she was just kind of sad and, and teary and I said, what's wrong? And she looked up at me and she said, mommy, I think this might be what depression feels like. And it was so striking because I think even in that moment as parents, you know, in Michigan, our kids ne weren't even allowed to go outside and play or, you know, somebody might call on them that they were called the police. They were outside. So it was months that they were locked in the house. And it struck me so hard because I thought, man, I've left because I've gone to the grocery store. I've done that. Their life has just shrunk into these tiny rooms in our house. And it has to be so hard for them. So certainly, yes, they went through this depression, but oftentimes even friends of mine have gone through, you know, a period of time where you lose a parent or you lose a child and suddenly they put you on an antidepressant. But I have to say one thing that I think every one of them would tell you is that at, although this was a medication for the mind, supposedly, there were physical side effects that are permanent in many cases. I mean, some weird side effects like constant sweating, sweating all over the body. And, and they're not told ahead of time that this is what's going to happen. And then they con they have that the rest of their lives, high blood pressure, uh, uh, fast heart rate, all of these things that come from these medications. They didn't have these problems before, but now they do women going through menopause. They're like, oh, if you have hot flashes, we're going to put you on an antidepressant. Why? Why would you take that chance? But they don't tell you any of the side effects that will mm -hmm. happen to you. Yeah. And one of the most serious ones is the suppression of the ability to love. And the way my colleagues uh, look at this is a sexual suppression. Mm -hmm. But it's deeper than that. There are functional things that happen to the ability to have an orgasm on the drug. And they're functional. They're physical, that is. They're physical. But the deeper thing is the, the loving passion is gone. It's it so true, but it's so true. There's like you, th and even you think about the relationship between a parent and a child. I mean, what is a mother like who can't feel deeply? You know, when you are, when your child needs you, you've got to be able to feel deeply. You talked about the nuclear family. And if mom and dad aren't feeling deeply about each other, how is that affecting the children in the family? I mean, this goes so much deeper than people are willing to talk about. I have several women in my practice right now who are dealing with their children when they were taking antidepressants during their early childhood and they're, they've been going back to their kids and saying, I'm different now. I appreciate how hard it must have been for you because mm -hmm. I really wasn't there for you. And, uh, but now they, and it's like, you know, it usually starts within coming off the first third or, or half, people begin to realize. Now, the important thing we must get in is that you can't stop these drugs called cold turkey. Yes. What psychiatrists yes. do is they say, sure, sure, uh, take a half tomorrow and then stop or something like that. Or, or we'll take you off uh, in three weeks or something like that. You know, just, just go home and cut it back for three weeks or something. That doesn't work. Um, you really have to. But go. I think that I've seen that happen. And I think that that is how they get them to go back on. Oh, well, you're not feeling. Yes, we should right. put you back on. Uh, you know, you're right. You're right. You're right. By the way, you're right on target about all of this stuff much, much more than most people who are in the media. And it's just a pleasure to talk to you about it. I mean, not, as much as you can have a pleasure talking about this. Right. Really <laughs> it's a tough been, subject, but you've been staring at this stuff for a long time, and and, and every, everything you've been thinking is, but from my experience writing books and science, I write science, a lot of scientific articles, and somehow get a lot of them published about this. Um, it's a I think it's so tragedy. manipulative, though, because it's like you're this is the thing that I, it makes me crazy is the psychiatrists come to you. Well, you're missing certain chemicals in the brain. This is going to fill that in. That will make you whole. When you hear that, you're like, I'm broken. I have outlets that aren't plugged in. Something has to go in there and fix me. And that's then right. it's not even just that, because that's manipulative enough and you feel like you need the drug. But then 
you have a label and those folks that have that label, they're like, oh, you don't know what it's like to be me. I'm this label. So I can't do this with you. I can't help you. And it just, the, the people around are just like, hmm, where do I fit anymore? Yeah, but that's where it kills family life. Mm -hmm. It's an odd thing how often the things that are marketed to us <clears throat> spoil everything that's basic to American society and to our, dem our constitutional democracy, you know, which is people who are full of energy, believe in themselves, have the courage to stand up for themselves, have their individualism, have their relationship to God. It doesn't matter whether it's the COVID shots or COVID itself, which was manufactured in a combination of U.S. and Chinese labs. We were the first. If you ones can't, to I mean, if you can't have a relationship with the people right in front of you, then faith is certainly a challenge to get to. That's that's, right. that's next level of you have to have belief in something. And this, that's these right. are folks who have lost belief in life, belief in themselves. And so stretching and, and holding on to God in those moments, it just doesn't seem like that is happening. And and I've seen it. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. And it makes me so mad because I'm like, I've, he I've heard politicians who said, oh, I'm going to go in and change this. And I think that has been really a lot of people's heart connection to RFK, because whether he is a raging liberal not, or not on this one issue, they're like, please, save us. Everybody wants a savior. So before I let you go on this subject, I want to ask you, what do people do to fight back against this machine that seems to have taken over every part of American life? Well, they should watch your TV show all the time. <laughs> they need to find this movement that I call the health freedom movement uh, of people because there are a lot of us who are standing up on these issues. Don't be alone with it. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things about loneliness is if you're living in the California, for example, I have two patients who live in California, you still can search out a conservative or a freedom loving organization where you'll find like minded people who uh, don't believe in psychiatric drugs, who don't believe in the jabs, who, who actually want to have a clean, healthy body and try to solve their problems through God, through love, through personal responsibility. If you can find the right therapist, not easy f through a therapist who believes in those things. Don't go to a therapist. If you believe in God, don't go to a therapist who doesn't. You should be talking about God and therapy. You should be talking about everything in life that can help heal you. Um, but it is very difficult right now, and you need friends, you need connections to keep up your, uh, your morality, your sense of, uh, of aliveness. So that's very, very important. Don't be stuck in a progressive community and think you can't find people. You can, um, whatever the community is. That's well, I think it's also things. really important if you are someone who knows a person who's on this medication and you've seen that change. And oftentimes that change is either the fog that you're talking about, but I've seen aggression. I've seen a total Absolutely. change in personality. All of these things, I don't think the person can always recognize it. You know, those commercials that used to say that about if you have thoughts of suicide or harming someone else, contact your doctor immediately. I thought that's hilarious. That's the That person's the last to recognize it. Yeah. Yes, I've actually written scientific articles about it. I coined the term medication spellbinding. The medications disrupt the frontal lobes sufficiently that we don't know we're having medication effects. Mm. And that's true for pretty much everybody. I mean, I used to take Benadryl sometimes at night for, for my allergies, and I'd get up in the morning and I'd be grumpy with my wife. Ginger, and she'd say, honey, I think you're being irritable with me. She said, no, you, did you take Benadryl last night? Well, that was the end of Benadryl for me. I didn't see it. I didn't want to believe it. This is, this is what I call this. It has a medical name, but I call it medication spellbinding. And it's real. And it's the kind of thing that they want to do to, to, a, to a people who are standing up for their freedom. I really more and more think it's systematic. And, and you can talk to people about it and uh, you can, you know, get, I mean, get my books. It's not just self-promotion. I wrote those books for a reason. One of them is Medication Madness. That's a, a good book just on the drugs. And it even has a chapter on how to come off the drugs safely and effectively. You can share that chapter with your therapist, not your psychiatrist, because your psychiatrist will probably try to tell you you need more medication. 
Mm-hmm. You just tell them you, you don't even tell them you've read any of my books, so they'll <laughs> want to commit you. So you have to be careful. <laughs> That's uh, probably true, though. Oh God, it could be true. Um, and um, really begin to open your mind that there is an evil in the world. Mm-hmm. I never thought this way before COVID. Ginger did. She's a little, often a little ahead of me on this stuff, but. But open your hearts to the possibility that what's going on is not by chance. That this world has always been ruled by empires. I mean, there was never a period of time when there weren't empires since civilization began. We got our freedom from the British Empire with the help of the French Empire. And there were three or four other empires, including the Dutch who were helping us with money and the Russians who weren't involved. Empires have always been a part of the world. They didn't end when we dis- when we destroyed the efforts of Germany and Japan, and and the USSR to uh, to have empires. And now we are using Bing as an empire. That's really an empire now. And to some extent, Bill Gates, Schwab, they're all building empires. They want to control humanity. It's the first time they've had the technology to do it. Get involved in politics. Get involved in standing up for human freedom. Do it at the local level. You know more about this than I do. You might want to say something about it. But stand up at the school board. Stand up. uh, Get the sheriff on your side. uh, Do everything you can to do grassroots. Because I think it's going to come down to some of the states against the United States. And we need to get the states strengthened. It's so true. I mean, you've got to be your own best advocate. I would say that even in my cancer experience with healthcare, do your own research, talk to more than one doctor, don't assume that the first doctor is correct. Make sure that you painfully go through as much information as you can before putting any medication into your body, which I think people are less likely to do today. I think people are like, oh, you're you're one of those crazy people who questions medication. You get one body. You get one chance. When I see all of these people that are being romanced into Ozempic and this and this quick fix. There are no quick fixes, folks. There just aren't. No, the quickest fix there is is love and God. Hmm. It's hmm. the quickest fix. And sometimes that one can work really, really well, providing you maintain your reason and your ethics. Yeah. You know, getting better is about strengthening your reason and your ethics. There's not a psychiatrist in the world would agree with that probably other than me and maybe three of my colleagues somewhere around the world because it's contrary to their making money. It's about reason and ethics and love. And we're all sources of love. I'm Jewish, by the way. This is New Testament. Love making it the center. My wife's Christian. Um, We're sources of love. It's impossible to be crazy and hopeless and helpless if you're loving, if and if you're grateful, and probably forgiving, just a few things like that. Each person, it's a different thing. This, to me, is what therapy is about. You can help a person understand they were abused as a child. You can understand why they wake up with night terrors and they don't know where it's from. And you can help by going back into the past as a therapist and looking at things. But you have to go back as the adult. You go Mm -hmm. back as the adult, Mm -hmm. loving the child, You go back as the responsible adult who's not going to let it overcome them anymore. And you go back with a determination to remain reasonable and caring and loving. And even then you'll be, then you'll even be able to handle what goes on in the world today because you'll have your own center. You'll have your own center. The world's been tough forever, folks. You'll have your own center. Well, this has been such a fun conversation. I mean, a hard topic, but really so nice to talk to you about this and have somebody that understands. I mean, it's something that I have been concerned about for years. And I feel like there's a small community of people out there who are going, waking up to this, like you said, that are going, "Mm, maybe this is less conspiracy theory and money makes people do a lot of bad things. And there's no industry that makes more money than the pharmaceutical industry. And I think we just have to be very, very cautious with our own health and with the health of our loved ones. And and you got to look out for those people because it is a tough world out there. Yep. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being here, Dr. Peter Bregan. Next time 
I'm bringing you back and we're going through Adderall because that's another one that I want to talk about. So you are going to have to come back and chat more. I, I want to come back. I, 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 that's such a concern to me. I've written at least four or five books to touch on what we do to our children and yeah. especially these stimulants. The stimulants are, and they're so widely prescribed. So we're, we'll definitely get into that. We'll have you back. Thank you so much for being on here today. Well, it's just, Tudor, it's just been wonderful talking with you. Just wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for joining us here on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. As always, for this episode and others, just go to TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or head over to the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us next time on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. Have a blessed day.